what's happening right now, Chloe has found the right spots where to put the electrodes. So we're going to put two electrodes on the occipital part of the brain, so the back of the head. Then we're going to have a couple of electrodes on the central part and a couple of electrodes on prefrontal areas. These two electrodes are basically measuring her frowning muscle. So if she has a nightmare, maybe she frowns, we'll see some activity. Perfect. The next step, we're going to connect her to the computer. Follow me. <laughs> The electrodes, they capture an average activity of hundreds of thousands of neurons. And the way we today conceptualize sleep stages is by the predominant frequency of neurons firing. Now you can go to bed. Okay. Uh, however, we'll be waking you up a few times for dream collection at sleep onset. Sweet dreams. <laughs> <laughs> I study dreams because I dream a lot and uh, investigating those phenomena helps me understand my own experiences better in certain ways. I also study dreams because I'm fortunate to be working in the Dream and Nightmare Laboratory. And our lab is, uh, is pretty special in the sense that there are a lot of sleep labs around the world, but it's pretty rare to have a lab specifically dedicated to scientific study of dreaming. So in dream research, our main difficulty is that we have to rely on people's first-person reports. And people vary greatly in their introspective capacity and in the way they used to tune into the world, in the way they would describe visual, auditory, uh, olfactory, kinesthetic sensations, etc. So what we want to know is, is it possible to find an expert group of dreamers? <laughs> Vipassana meditation is a kind of meditation where people typically start with just mindfulness of their breathing and attending to, attuning to their sensations without judging and then slowly progress to scanning their whole body. We're hoping that Vipassana meditators, because they're used to paying attention to those things, will actually describe better the kind of bodily changes that they will undergo during sleep and in dreaming. These are sleep um, key complexes and sleep spindles and she's having more and more slow waves, so she's actually falling deeper asleep. Dreaming can be so intense and so vivid that it will uh, affect how you live your life. Some people have nightmares that make their waking life miserable, and the, the affect is carried over. Oh, she's moving. Another offshoot of my study takes part at the Topological Media Lab, where we create immersive audiovisual environments. We want to probe more into the depth of dream experience in an interactive, interpersonal way. Right now, we are at a very interesting uh, historical moment when meditation studies and dream studies are really exploding. There is a, a real rise of interest in subjective data, in complementing subjective data with third-person data, and then we would also need overarching humanities to help us bring those two together. Mixing neurosciences with humanities, with philosophy, with media arts, that allows for very unusual collaborations and so for very unusual insights into the human mind. Yeah, these are the eye movements, the rapid eye movements. REM sleep is a sleep stage when we're most likely to have vivid, intense, uh, immersive dream experiences. So at that point, we would wake them up and we would expect them to give us their dream report. All right. Hey, Michelle. Would you tell us your dream? OK. Uh, at the beginning of the dream, I was in bed here, and I was trying to fall asleep. And a little gray cat came in onto the bed but actually it was Lisa, and Lisa was telling me it was time to get up. And then I, I walked out into the, into the, the lab room, actually, following Lisa the cat. And at some point, though, I became aware that I was dreaming. And Lisa had little potato chips sprayed out all over the room. So I think that's when I realized I was dreaming. I don't know, there were all sorts of like machines in the room. It wasn't just the computers like it is now. There were other machines that were all like working. 
Like there seemed to be like a conveyor belt going around the room. I remember flying for a minute, moving my legs up and down like a dolphin. And then I was in a new scene. I was in a tree and I was in like a group of women. I remember feeling left out because they were all talking and I wasn't really included in the conversation. Yeah, I guess that's all I can remember. Thank you. <laughs> that's it? That's super. Okay. Yeah, this is really a pilot uh, study. This is the first time we've ever done anything like that. Uh, so uh, our future studies will be informed by our successes and our mistakes. We'll see what the future holds, but I would really like to keep exploring the mind from all those different perspectives. Ripples starting from where you're poking the pond set out and they spread over the surface of the pond. So Einstein's picture of space-time is, is similar. If there's a black hole that sits around in, in space and has nothing bright around it or no other matter that's falling into it that can glow, we can't know about it. We can't learn much about it. Whereas if we could study the gravitational waves from that black hole, we could reconstruct almost everything about it.